continuing with the seventh chapter of the Once and Future King. Um, the wart has just asked Merlin if he can see King Pelinor in a joust. Merlin said, That will do very well. Put your hands to your sides and relax your muscles. Cabricaris. Akai. Thorum. Cattlemus. Singularita. Nomitavio. Heck. Musa. Shut your eyes and keep them shut. Bonus. Bona bonum. Here we go. Deus Santus. Esne orito latinus. Etem quoquere. Quoque? Que substantivo et agictum. Concordat. In genari. Numerum et casus. Here we are. While this incantation was going on, Ward experienced some queer sensations. First, he could hear the sergeant calling out to Kay, No there! No there! Keep the eel down the swing of your body from the hips! And the words got, then the words got smaller and smaller, as if he were looking at his feet through the wrong end of a telescope, and began to swirl round in a cone, as if they were at the pointed bottom of a whirlpool, which was sucking him into the air. Then there was nothing but a loud rotating, roaring, and hissing noise, which rose to such a tornado that he felt he could not stand it any more. Finally, there was utter silence and Merlin saying, Here we are! All this happened <clears throat> about the time it would take a sixpenny rocket to start off with its fiery swish, bend down from its climax, and disperse itself in thunder and colored stars. He opened his eyes just at the moment when you would have heard the invisible stick hitting the ground. They were lying under a beech tree in the forest sauvage. Here we are, said Merlin. Get up and dust your clothes. And there, I think, continued the magician in a tone of great satisfaction, because his spells had worked for once without a hitch, is your friend, King Pelinor, pricking towards us there or the plain. Hello! Hello! cried King Pelinor, popping his eyes up and down. It's the young boy with the feather bed, isn't it? I say what? Yes, it is, said Wart, and I am very glad to see you. Did you manage to catch the beast? No, said King Pelinor, didn't catch the beast. Do come here, you bracket, and leave that bush alone. Cha, cha, naughty, naughty. She runs riot, you know what? Very keen on rabbits, I tell you. There's nothing in it, you beastly dog. Cha, cha, leave it, leave it, or do come to heel, as I tell you. She never does come to heel, added King Pelinor. At this, the dog put a cock pheasant out of the bush, which rocketed off with a tremendous clutter, and the dog became so excited that it ran around its master three or four times at the end of its rope, panting hoarsely as if it had asthma. King Pelinor's horse stood quite patiently while the rope was being wound round its legs, and Merlin and the wart had to catch the bracket and unwind it before the conversation could proceed. I say, said King Pelinor, thank you very much, I must say. Wouldn't you introduce me to your friend, what? This is my tutor, Merlin, and a great magician. How did do, said the king. Always like to meet a magician. In fact, I always like to meet anybody, you know. It sort of passes the time away, what, on a quest. Hail, said Merlin in a most mysterious manner. Hail, replied the king, anxious to make a good impression, and they shook hands. Did you say hail, inquired the king, looking at him nervously. I thought it was going to be fine myself. He means how do you do, exclaimed the ward. Ah, yes, how did do, they shook hands again. Good afternoon, said King Pelinor. What do you think the weather looks like now? I think it looks like an anticyclone, said Merlin. Ah, yes, said the king, an anticyclone. Well, I suppose I ought to be getting along. At this, the king trembled very much, opened and shut his visor several times, coughed, wove his reins into a knot, exclaimed, I beg your pardon, and showed signs of cantering away. He is a white magician, said the wart. You needn't be afraid of him. He is my best friend, your majesty, and in any case... He generally gets his spells muddled up. Ah, oh, yes, said King Pelinor. A white magician, what? How small the world is, is it not? How did do? 
Hail, said Merlin. Hail, said King Pellinore. They shook hands for a third time. I shouldn't go away, said Merlin, if I were you. Sir Grumor Grummerson is on his way here to challenge you to a joust. No, you don't say. Sir, what you may you may call it coming here to challenge me to a joust? Assuredly. Good handicap, man. I should think so. It would be a pretty even match. Well, I must say, exclaimed the king, it never hails, but it pours. Hail, said Merlin. Hail, said King Pellinore. Hail, said the warden involuntarily. Now, I really won't shake hands with anybody else, announced the monarch. We shall simply have to have all met before. We shall simply assume that we have all met before. Is Sir Grandma really coming, inquired the warden hastily changing the subject, to challenge King Pellinore to a battle. Look yonder, said Merlin, and both of them looked in the direction of his outreached finger. Sir Grummer Grummerson was cantering up the clearing. In full panoply of war, instead of his ordinary helmet with visor, he was wearing the proper tilting helm, which looked like a large coal scuttle, and, he, and as he cantered, he clanged. He was singing his old school song, We'll toot together, steady, from cover to pole, and nothing in life shall sever. Our love, all the dear old coal, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, till the shield ring again and again, with the cranks and of the cranky true men. Goodness, exclaimed King Pellinore. It's about two months since I had a proper tilt, and last winter they put me up to eighteen. That was when I had the new handicaps, you know. Sir Grummer had arrived while he was speaking, and he recognized the ward. Morning, said Sir Grummer. You're Sir Rector's boy, ain't ya? Who's that chap with the comic hat? That's my tutor, said the ward hurriedly. Merlin, the magician. Sir Grummer looked at Merlin. Magicians were considered rather middle class by the true jousting set in those days, and said distinctly, Ah, a magician, how did do? And this is King Pellinor, said the war. Sir Grummer Grummerson, King Pellinor. How do you do, said Sir Grummer. Hail, said King Pellinor. No, I mean it won't hail, will it? Nice day, said Sir Grummer. Yes, it is nice. What isn't it? Been questioned today. Oh, yes, thank you. Always am questioned, you know. After the question beast. Interesting job, that. Yes, interesting. Would you like to see some fumits? By Jove, yes, like to see some fumits. I have some better ones at home, but these are quite good, really. Bless my soul, are these her fumits? Yes, they are her fumits. Interesting fumits. Yes, they are interesting, aren't they? Only you get Only you get tired of them, added King Pellinore. Well, well, it's a fine day, isn't it? Yes, it is rather fine. I suppose we'll have a joust day, what? Yes, I suppose we had better, said King Pellinore. Really? What shall we have it for? Oh, the usual thing, I suppose. Would one of you kindly help me on with my helm? They all three had to help him on eventually, for what with the unscrewing of screws and the easing of nuts and bolts which the king had clumsily set on the wrong thread, when getting up in a hurry that morning it was quite a feat of engineering to get him out of his helmet and into his helm. The helm was an enormous thing, like an oil drum, padded inside with two thicknesses of leather and three inches of straw. As soon as they were ready, the two knights stationed themselves at each end of the clearing and then advanced to meet one another in the middle. Fair knight, said King Pellinore, I pray tell thee the my na I pray thee tell me thy name. That me regards, replied Sir Grummer, using the proper formula. That is uncourteously said, said King Pellinore. What? For no knight need dreadeth to speak his name openly, but for some reason of shame. Be that as it may, I choose that thou shalt not know my name at this time for no asking. Then you must stay and joust with me, false knight. Haven't you got the wrong Pellinore? inquired Sir Grummore. I believe... Haven't you got that wrong Pellinore? inquired Sir Grummore. I believe that ought to be thou shalt. Oh, I'm sorry, Sir Grummore. Yes, so it should, of course. Then thou shalt stay and joust with me, false knight. Without further words, the two gentlemen retreated to opposite ends of the clearing, feutered their spears, 
and prepared to hurtle together in the preliminary charge. I think we had better climb up this tree, said Merlin. You never know what will happen in a joust like this. They climbed up the big beech, which had very which which had low, easy branches sticking out in all directions, and the wart stationed himself toward the end of a smooth bough about fifteen feet up, where he could get a good view. Nothing is so comfortable to sit in as a big beach. In order to be able to picture the terrible battle which now took place, there is one thing which ought to be known. A knight in full armor in those days was generally carrying as much or more of his own, than his own weight in metal. He weighed no less than twenty-two stone, and sometimes as much as twenty-five. This meant that his horse had to be a slow and enormous weight carrier, like the farm horse of today, and that his own movements were so hampered by his burden of iron and padding that they were toned down into slow motion, as in motion pictures. "'They're off!' cried the wart, holding his breath with excitement. Slowly and majestically the ponderous horses lumbered into a walk. The spears, which had been pointing in the air, bowed down to a horizontal line and pointed at each other. King Pellinor and Sir Grummer could be seen by the thumping of their ho horses' sides with their heels for all they were worth, and in a few minutes the splendid animals had shambled into an earth-shaking imitation of a trot. Clank, rumble, thumpity thump, and now the two knights were flapping their elbows and legs in unison, showing a good deal of daylight at their seats. There was a charge in temp there was a change in tempo, and Sir Grummer's horse could be definitely seen to be cantering. In another minute King Pellinor was doing so too. It was a terrible spectacle. Oh dear exclaimed the wart, feeling slightly ashamed that his own bloodthirstiness had been responsible for making these two knights joust before him. Do you think they will Do you think they will kill each other? Dangerous sport, said Merlin, shaking his head. No cried the wart. With a blood-curdling thumping of iron hooves, the mighty equestrians came together. Their spears wavered for a moment within a few inches of each other's helms. Each had chosen the difficult point, stro point stroke, and then they were galloping off in opposite directions. Sir Grumor drove his spear deep into the beech tree where they were sitting and stopped dead. King Pellinor, who had been run away with, vanished altogether behind his back. "'Is it safe to look?' inquired the wart who had shut his eyes tight at the critical moment. "'Quite safe,' said Merlin. "'It will take them some time to get back.' "'Whoa! Well, I say!' cried King Pellinor, in muffled and distant tones, far away among some, goose bu some gorse bushes. "'Hi, Pellinor, hi!' shouted Sir Grummer. "'Come back, my dear fella. I'm over here!' There was a long pause while the complicated stations of the two knights readjusted themselves, and then King Pellinor was at the opposite end, from that at which he had started, while Sir Grummer faced him from his original position. "'Traitor knight!' cried Sir Grummer. "'Yield! Recant! What?' cried Pe King Pellinor. They feutered their spears again and thundered into the charge. "'Oh!' said the wart. "'I hope they don't hurt themselves!' But the two mounts were patiently blundering together, and the two knights had simultaneously decided upon the sweeping stroke. Each held his spear straight out at right angles toward the left, and before the wart could say anything further, there was a terrific yet melodious thump, clang, and the armor, like a, like a motor like a motor omnibus, in collision with a smithy, and the jousters were sitting side by side on the green sward, while their horses cantered off in opposite directions. A splendid fall, said Merlin. The two horses pulled themselves up, their duty done, and began resignedly to eat the sward. King Pellinor and Sir Grummar sat looking straight before them, each with the other's spear clasped hopefully under his arm. And we will pause there.